Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Catherine Bertine and we talk about her new book, her compelling new book, Stand, a memoir on activism and manual for progress. A subtitle, What Really Happens When We Stand on the Front Lines of Change. You got to check it out just for the book cover alone. Catherine and I had a great time. She's an author. She's an athlete. She's an activist. And we we covered a whole lot of ground, as she does in her book. And you, you are going to want to step into, uh, I think, this conversation at any point, really. Uh, but I think you're going to want to give it a full, full listen and get a sense for where Catherine's at. Uh, in her life and her her writing and and her work, we we talk about the gender gap. We talk about uh, questioning authority. We get into journalism and 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 we talk we talk a great deal. What's bonkers? Uh, I think that was one of my favorite moments in 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 the uh, interview. But what's bonkers with regard uh, to to uh, equality? We talk about trend setting and 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 why and how that's so important, and also why the power of note taking is uh, a, an important part of, of anyone's life who, who wants to write, who wants to push back, who wants to, you know, be an activist of any kind. I mean, frankly, I think keeping notes, something I learned uh, as simple as, you know, writing it down, post-it notes, isn't that what they were made for? We talk about her dad, who was her hero. We talk about her life upheaval and, and, and antiquated systems. <laughs> But, you know, don't forget, I, I said it earlier, the bonkers factor comes up in a variety of different places. But she talked very, um, um, in a very moving way about Robin Williams, and it comes out in her writing as well, but who, uh, about him being a beacon of hope, uh, you know, to folks who, who just aren't, you know, what we would call the norm. And we get into mental health issues. And yeah, I, I just, I so appreciated the time I spent with Catherine. And, and she just... Uh, she she's got a, 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 a an energetic and a, a very positive approach to to this thing called life and and we covered a whole lot of ground and and talked a lot about you know things not being quite as they seem i'll leave that for you to to uh, dig a little deeper uh, into the interview and into her book don't forget it's called stand you'll be able to access that online and through the uh, the podcast on on my website davidpecklive.com don't forget you can find out more about the writing i do and my public speaking um, also the uh, podcasting face to face live uh, everything is there now under one umbrella it's fantastic it's exciting from my perspective i hope yours too uh, check out the library there we it's it's a long list of interviews just coming off of tiff we've got so many wonderful guests that we've had over the last uh, few years and even in my case the last few days so do check those out and sign up for the newsletter uh, face to face we send it out about four times a year also we'd really appreciate it if you would follow us uh, on Twitter, on social media, uh, sign up for the YouTube channel, subscribe to it and like it. Uh, we would, we, we need that. And we also need reviews. So uh, we, we'd, we'd love a review or two from folks who are listening, not only to this interview, but uh, to others as well. If you appreciate what we've been doing along the way, please give us a thumbs up from time to time. And sometimes that's literally just clicking a button, but you can also uh, give us a thumbs up by uh, stepping in a little deeper and writing a, a, a small, short review on iTunes. We would really appreciate it. So uh, socially mediate us, get it out, get us out there to family and friends. And we so appreciate your support. And, and thanks again uh, for listening. Uh, coming right up, Catherine Bertine talking about her new book, Stand, a memoir on activism, a manual for progress. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined, that's Face to Face Live, actually. Welcome to uh, another conversation here. Uh, we are in fact face to face but sadly it's digital we're not in the same room uh, but but uh, it's it's going to be a great conversation either way Catherine Bertin is here to talk about her new book Stand and I'm pretty sure a lot of other things Catherine thanks for joining me here today on Face to Face Hi David thank you for having me I love your show it's great to be part of it 
Thank you very much. I, pre- I appreciate that. It's uh, been a busy day of interviews. It's so funny how uh, I can go two weeks without doing an interview, and it's really about the production and about the chase producing and getting interviews and so on. But today, today's been busy. So, wow, I, you know, I don't know where to start really, you know, having read the book, knowing a little bit more about you. How about we start with your website for, for listeners who, who want to learn a little bit more about you, katherinebertine.com. Right, and then in your name, you, they can find you on social that way. We'll talk about that at the at the end of the interview as well. So, can you give my listeners a tiny bit of context? Not maybe, I mean, for stand, of course, but just from a little autobiography would be a great place to start. Yeah, I've had what I would call an atypical path <laughs> through uh, through adulthood, um, but a really. Um, interesting and fun journey for me. Uh, and I like to tell people that, you know, what I thought I would be doing as a teenager or in my early twenties, I completely took a left turn (laughs) and, you know, didn't take the typical route that, uh, that most women do. And, um, it's not been easy for sure, but I've kind of loved the journey. I suppose that I identify in three different categories. Uh, I would say that I am an author, an athlete, and an activist. And the three of those have intertwined in a way that I never would have expected. And they've led me on some, some crazy adventures. And that's a little bit of the backstory. Uh, so I'll pause there and, and let you take the reins. So I'm fascinated by, so, so we've got Stand, a, mem- a, memoir, a memoir on activism, a manual for progress, the subtitle, what, what really happens when we stand on the front lines of change. I mean, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to talk about the appendix, uh, which is worth the, the price of the book uh, on its own, it seems to me. Uh, and we'll, uh, hopefully we'll get to that, but, but just some, some great sort of, um, I would say, I guess, lessons learned, but also that's where the manual for me really sort of kicked in. It was much more of a, uh, a, a memoir, enjoyed the book, learned so much, uh, about you and about your story, but just about, I guess about pushing back against the status quo. Can you talk a little bit about how at some point you said, this just doesn't work for me. This is not right. I need to say something. I need to step out. I need to, you know, that was that moment you became that activist, I guess. (laughs) Sure. Absolutely. So I had a career in the world of professional cycling, specifically road cycling. Um, It started with a journalism assignment where Uh, I worked for ESPN for a number of years, and the assignment there was, this was back in 2006, they wanted to see, what does it really take to get to the Olympic Games? And it was this very broad assignment of like, go try sports, see what it takes. And the condensed version is that I got into cycling and um, fell in love with the sport. So even when the assignment ended, and by the way, that entire assignment is its own book <laughs> that came out before. Stan. This is this is your fourth book, yes. This is the fourth one. Yep. Yeah. And um, as good as gold, which is the the title of that book, um, that assignment. Uh, so I'm going to give a spoiler alert that uh, I didn't make the Olympic Games in 18 months, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but what happened was I really, truly fell in love with road cycling. And when the assignment ended, my my drive and passion for the sport was just getting started. And I had the opportunity to race against some pretty amazing women. And I kept thinking, wow, what if I could actually make it to the professional level and race amongst these incredible athletes. That would be such an amazing goal. So uh, that's exactly what happened. After the assignment ended, I kept riding. And um, keep in mind, at this point in, you know, oh gosh, now we're in 2007. No, well, technically the Olympics were 2008. And I'd only been riding for a year at that point. And uh, yeah, and I started late. You know, I was about 31 when I first got on a bike. And that's considered in many people's eyes, oh, that's way too old to start, you know. Right, right. (laughs) But I had other sports that, you know, I did over the years. And it kind of led me to this place where it's like, wait, I'm strong and I've got some talent. Maybe I can do something with it. So long story short, um, I set those goals on becoming a pro cyclist. And I actually earned a pro cycling contract, my first one in 2012 at the age of 37. And I raced on the world tour for the next five years. And, um, what was happening along the way was 
I, you know, I'm in love with the sport, but this time I'm in my late thirties heading to the forties and just being a slightly more mature adult than I was in my younger years. I was also very keyed into the fact that this sport was bonkers in terms of equality. Absolutely <laughs> insane. It was bonkers. So for reference, I grew up, um, I played any sport that was available to me, you know, uh, but I, what I fell in love with most was figure skating because I live near a rink. Um, I also loved softball and track and field. In college, I was a rower. And the one thing that all those sports share in common is that men and women and boys and girls have equal access to the playing fields of those respective sports. And when I got over into cycling, and you know, also I had been a triathlete, same thing. Men and women race the same distances, the same courses. You're not racing against the men, but you have equal access to, you know, to these events. So I get over to cycling, and sure enough, of course, we have a men's field and a women's field, but the differences were astronomical. The women were not invited to all of the events. Um, the events that we were invited to, our distance was often cut right in half. So if it was 100 miles for the men, it was 50 miles for the women. Based on the ideology that, oh, women can't possibly go 100 miles, right? This really antiquated thinking. And then at the professional level, the prize purse at the World Tour ranking for the women was fractions, pennies on the dollar for what it was for the men. And none of this made sense to me. And I think that's what really turned the page for me um, into the realm of activism. Was, it, was there, was there, I don't know, uh, was there a book, was there a film, was there an accident? Cause I know that's a part of your, your world too, that, that was a, what that really sort of acted as a, uh, I don't know, bold typed catalyst, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Or do you think it was more gradual? I mean, it seems to me, I don't know. Are we born activists? No, I don't think so. But it's it's a bit of nature. It's a bit of nurture, right? I think it's a both and. But but anyway, I'm always fascinated by people who don't who 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 don't put up with the status quo, right? <laughs> I just I love that, right? Because that's that's resistance is is where change happens. It seems to me. Right, right. No, I appreciate that, and I agree that I too am drawn to people who question authority, question the system, right? Um, and. For me, I would say that there were two areas that kind of did that for me. And one was the fact that um, the Tour de France, which is probably the one race that all the world at least knows, oh, that's a bike race in France. You know, sure, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, you've heard, you've heard of it. Yeah. Right, yeah. You've heard of it. You know, 99. You've, you've heard of Wimbledon. You may not play tennis, but you've heard of Wimbledon, exactly. probably, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and that was true for the Tour de France. So, you know, when I started this journey and setting these big goals, I was like, I want to race at the Tour de France. And then it was revealed to me that that's impossible because they don't have a women's race. And then my journalism side kicked in and I started asking, right. why, 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 why? Right, you know? right. <laughs> and there were no good answers. So I would say that that was the, that was the turning point for me of how is it possible, you know, if we have women at Wimbledon and women in the Olympics and women running the Boston Marathon, how do we not have women at the Tour de France, right? Um, and another part of that, when I started doing research, you know, um, I came across the incredible Catherine Switzer, who back in 1967 became the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon. And I was just enamored with this college student who put on, you know, a gray sweatsuit and wore a hood. And all she wanted to do was run, you know, and the fact that there weren't women allowed and, um, I just thought that that was incredible and amazing. And I actually reached out to her and I said, I want to make this happen at the Tour de France. Um, can I just engage in conversation with you about ideas and how that could happen? And she responded. Oh, that's you know? so great. It is. It's so great. It's so yeah, great. That's cool. She was in her, her um, mid to late sixties, if not early seventies by then. And she just responded. And I think that's such an important part because I think in this modern day and age, we look at people as very untouchable in the, realm of, um, you know, fame or, you know, trendsetters, or in her case, you know, just a historic figure for sport, but she answered, you know, and, uh, that, that was another pivotal moment, even if I don't know if I realized it at the time. Yeah. Pieces of puzzle, uh, pieces to the puzzle, right. In, in, in the, I have a friend who's a comedian who years ago wrote a joke and I'm sure it's uh, been expanded on in other ways, but, 
but uh, just to upset his father, he had a had a, had a had a puzzle, but he threw in five hundred pieces from another puzzle, <laughs> and and it's a great joke, and the way he delivers it is funny. Uh, Jay's his name, a dear friend, but you know what? Isn't that kind of life in a way? I mean, it's a funny joke, but and you can see the frustrated dad trying to put these pieces together, <laughs> but you know, you look back, you see the connections. Yeah, you right? see the connections. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I really got that sense from Stan. Is uh, do you keep a really detailed diary? Like, I as I was looking at your book, I'm like, how how do you remember all this stuff? Oh yeah, absolutely. I do. I keep a journal for sure. Got um, it. That's something that I used to do as a kid. You know, just in the early days, dear diary. You know, and I eventually, as I became a writer. I realized how important it was to keep a record of things. Um, now, keep in mind, a lot of the a lot of the diary was often just quick notes. It's not like I was forming well crafted paragraphs. Sure, sure. But I knew if I was going to step into this arena of fighting for change, I better keep a record of what's going on. And then, luckily, all of the parts of dialogue, or you know, the majority of the dialogue. Um, especially when I started talking or, or when you were reading about the pressure group, La Tour Entier that we formed, you know, with the world champions in cycling, we had all of our emails were so back and forth. And I kept a record of all those emails because I wanted to make sure that I got the quotes right. And, uh, you know, and same thing too, from some of the sources that were uh, not on the same page as me in terms of what mm -hmm. we were fighting for. I knew that I'd have to keep a record of sources, otherwise right. things would get challenging. And I'm like, look, I'm I'm going to speak the truth, but the last thing I need is to be sued. So I better have a record. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, that's really interesting. There's so many uh, uh, lessons there, it seems to me. Obviously, the journalist in you was came out, but if you were already doing this as a kid, my my dad kept notes. He used to say it was because he couldn't remember things, but he would he would have he would have post it notes. All I mean, <laughs> pre post it note. Actually, he was in the paper business. So, he, are you are you a post it note fiend like I am? Yeah, they're it's like one, I've got them everywhere. Like, there's like six of these stacks over there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got them all over the house. Yeah, yeah. and but it, I think the idea of writing things down, of keeping records. Yes, of course, this is what our memories about. And hopefully our photos are, uh, 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 you know, we've got good files of those as well and our friends and our community. But I think there's something about the written word here that, 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 that's super helpful on so oh, many yeah. levels. I also feel like once I have it down on paper or on the computer in some way, um, it actually freed up space in my brain. Mm. It's good. Yeah. I think that's 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 super. That's great advice. Yeah, yeah I uh, I've I've had sleeping <laughs> issues for years, and I remember um, yeah. probably a therapist that I was seeing at the time who would say, you know, just before you go to bed, instead of reflecting on all those things that you didn't get done today, how about writing down the things that you did get done that yes. that you did accomplish that were positive, right? And and we're so yeah, beautiful, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, I think there's uh, words words of words of wisdom for sure. Yeah. So let's nice segue into the Robin Williams quote. Oh, okay. Yep. No matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world. It seems like you had a really beautiful relationship with your dad. I, I don't want to project too much, but um, at a, per, a point in the in the book, he says that I think it was him anyway. Help me out here if I'm wrong, but you're happiest when you're making change. Yes. Yes. Right, right on so, all <laughs> Yeah. So, so when the gloves are on <laughs> is when you're feeling the most, I don't know, presence, joy. I, I'd love for you to tell us about that and maybe connect it to the Robin Williams quote. Cause I think a photo of him appears in the book as well. Does it not? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll start with the dad part. There's I, a lot going on there, oh, by the way. There's so much, there's so much, but steer me back if I, if I forget something. No, no, it's all good. My dad was and is my my hero in that regard. He was an amazing, kind, wonderful, nurturing soul um, who, as you know from reading Stan, he helped me in so many regards, especially when I went through a period of life where, you know, shit hit the fan. And he really was there for me when I needed support the most. Um, and I, I lost my father a year ago. And um, of course, I'm okay now in terms of being mm, able to, yeah. <laughs> you know, to talk about it. But it's boy, so hard, right? Oh yeah. wow! There's nothing like it to lose somebody who is truly your best friend. 
Um, but yeah, I also, I'm so sorry, Catherine. Yeah. Oh no, thank you, thank you. I like sharing this part of the story because during the the two years of um, what I call life upheaval, I actually mm. lived with my dad for two years from the ages of um, oof, let's see, uh, 30, 38 to forty, and to be able, you know, and it was a really tough time for me, but to actually be able to live with my dad as a grown up and to have these amazing conversations that, you know, I couldn't have had as a teenager or a kid. Um, it, it was just such a beautiful experience to know my dad as a person, to know him as a friend. Um, yeah, that's cool. So, you know, and, and you'll know when you, for anyone who, um, you know, if you read Stan, he's, he's a huge character in, in the best possible way. And I feel like he's very much still with me on the journey. And, you know, hey, can you, can you, can you just encourage me a little bit here? Yes. I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old. <laughs> Is that going to happen at some point for me too? And my wife, Elizabeth, <laughs> like I'm, I'm hoping so. And honestly, I'm teasing. Uh, I love we, it. Have, It'll we, we have great kids, but, yeah. but yeah, you, I've, I've heard that you, you kind of lose them, but they kind of come back. Right. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Yeah, because, so that's you know, wonderfully affirming to hear. Yeah, yes, very encouraging. you have to remember too that at that age, they're very, you know, they're almost pre-programmed to take you for granted that you're there and that you're always right. going to be there. Right. You Funny. Know? Yeah. So at that age too, and when I was a kid, what my dad did. This is when I was a figure skater. He drove me to the rink every morning at five fifteen. You know, <laughs> like he was such a saint, and um. It wasn't even like as kids, we had big, deep conversations. The thing was, he was always there, you know, mm. um, whether it was driving me to a sporting practice or uh, come into a game now and then, whatever it was, he was there and he would just clap and encourage and be like, right, you go, you know, that's it. That's it. That's and great. later as an adult, we definitely had a lot more, you know, bonding conversation. But so I, where that all is going, I said, just hang in there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's up. good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Thank, thanks for that. My fragile ego needed that. Aww. So, so journalists posted notes all over your house. You've been writing things down forever. So, it really, no one had to convince you of this Robin Williams quote. No matter quote what people tell you, uh, words and ideas can change the world. Close quote. I have sort of believed this for many years. I find that it's a bit of an uphill battle. You're kind of rolling the rock up the hill like Sisyphus in the Greek myth. Ha have you had that same experience? I mean, um, oh, and by the way, just a little circle back and a tie-in. Did you ever use the word bonkers when you were talking to people uh, in, in the cycling world when you, you know, your comment about this gender disparity is bonkers in this sport? Because that, that would have really establish some credibility i think yeah right? i know i mean to to my fellow competitors and cohorts oh we all thought it was bonkers and, yeah, yeah. and crazy and insane so amongst I us bet. we knew we were in good company um but you know i don't i can't recall a time that i actually went up to somebody who was in a position of power or a change maker and actually said hey guess what this is bonkers and you're bonkers. Yeah. Um, yeah, bonkers I, it's just such a great <laughs> word because you, you sort of have to take it seriously, but you can't help but not smile at the same time. Oh, I'm glad you bring that up, you know, and you know this from reading Stan, but I talk very openly about how humor is so oh, necessary. It's, in the, it's one of the appendices, isn't it? Like it is. laughter, you know, is, is. is the best medicine kind of approach. It's the whole idea. Is it, you have to, when you're fighting for change and you're up against um, these antiquated systems that are in play, you better bring your sense of humor and it better be big because it's just, again, it's the bonkers factor. There's, there's, it's so crazy how things are still not equal in this day and age. And you can either let that frustrate you to the point where you want to quit, or you can look at it and be like, oh my God, that's bonkers. It's funny. It's sad. How do we fix it? But also let's laugh along the way. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. I interviewed CJ Hunt yesterday, who's made a film called The Neutral Ground. Okay. He's a producer at The Daily Show and Trevor Noah at The Daily Show and super funny guy. He wanted to be a middle school teacher. And it's about the removal of four Confederate statues in Louisiana. It's it's unsettling, it's serious, it's thoughtful, it's all of those things that you would think a film uh, about, you know, systemic racism is, is going to be about and, and, and history. And, and 
but it's also really funny. And, and he just, he starts out by, and I, 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 I'd love to get to know this guy more because he's got this great beat. He says something really serious. And then there's the, the tag, which, mm-hmm. you know, allows me to relax, which is what is such a beautiful thing about comedy. Now I'm connecting it back to Robin Williams. I mean, talk about a serious actor, but goofy as you know goofy gets Mm -hmm. and yet comes out with a line like this so it's just yeah so i'd I'd love to yeah i mean what was he a a a significant domino for you oh he he was he certainly was um first in a couple ways um in stand i talk about when we make the film half the road which is a documentary on women's pro cycling or all of women cycling, really. Well, hang on. So hang on. Not just an author, an athlete, and an activist, but also a filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. I kind of lumped the filmmaking into the uh, the author because I had to write the narrative for the documentary. So Got it. <laughs> I see. Totally so there's filmmaker. like footnotes. There's footnotes. There, and <laughs> filmmaker didn't begin with an A. So sometimes I'm just silly and I'm like, and a filmmaker. Like, oh, how, <laughs> how about auteur? How about auteur, the French, the French word? Oh, yes. Uh, exactly. There's a lot. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's I love that. But yeah, that's, um, you know, that's where the Robin Williams side came in. So for those of you who follow cycling, you will already know that Robin Williams was an avid cyclist. He loved it. You know, he wasn't a racer, but he loved bike riding. He did Grand Fondo events. Um, He was a huge fan of the sport and he had a gazillion in his possession. He loved cycling. So um, when we got to the point where we were looking for a narrator for Half the Road, um, I tracked down his publicist and asked, you know, very respectfully, would Robin be interested in doing this? And yes, of course, we'll pay him. You know, we're not asking for for you to work for free. But um, and he was already involved in another project, so we had to turn it down. But what I loved was that he actually considered it and and wished us luck on the project, mm, nice. and that, you know, made him all the more human to us too. Um, and you know, that it was, it was a lovely, lovely moment. So that was the first interaction that I had, you know, I had also during my triathlon days, I raced escape from Alcatraz and, uh, the bike race went right by his house and, um, he was outside like turning cartwheels on the lawn. Like this is way back in 2005 ish, you know, but, uh, just, just a great guy all around. And I always thought, you know, I'll meet him someday, but it really, really came into effect for me. Um, you know, as you get deeper into stand and I won't go into too, too much detail. Um, cause that would take a whole other hour. <laughs> but <laughs> right. I will definitely, That's part two. Yeah. But I will say this when I was struggling with some really tough mental health issues in 2014, you know, stemming from divorce and depression and just a really, really wretched stretch. Um, I was so far in the rabbit hole that I mm. was creating my own exit plan. I didn't think that I could or should be here anymore. Uh, it was a devastating, devastating wow. time. It was really, really profound. And what distracted me from moving forward and carrying out that plan was the fact that Robin Williams had taken his life that mm. day. Um, it was August 11th of, of 2014. And, and of course, I was absolutely uh, just destroyed by that. You know, how did this beautiful brain, this incredible right. person, um, and in many ways, his own version of activism too. You know, he certainly was not the norm. And he, he you know, was a beacon of, of hope to people who were also not the norm. And right. to lose good. him, it really, really affected me. Um, I mean, of course, suicide can and should affect everybody very deeply. Um, that one to me felt even more personal than Oh, just a celebrity. I don't know. You know, it, right. something right. really hit me deeply with that. And, um, and it distracted me to the point where I was like, okay, you know what? I need to get help and I need to find a way through this awful dark period. If I was at that place of ready to, to end it all, then I kn- now I realize that I'm not alone. Something is wrong and I need help. And so Robin was that person for me. Catherine, I got to ask you this question because I think, I don't know anyone. Well, maybe I do know some, but I would imagine most of us have struggled with this. And, and you and I have already had a couple of conversations that weren't recorded where we talked about mental health issues. You know, it, it, awareness around these issues are growing. People are talking about it more all the time. There's campaigns that are developed, you know, 
this is a good thing, right? This is like dinner table conversation, you know? So, so, so you, you use a phrase that has really stuck with me. Um, and I'm going to see if I can quote it here, but I think it's early on in the book, the weight of worthlessness consumed me. And I mean, that's, I mean, A, it's incredibly candid for you to put that in print. And I mean, again, it's memoir, it's diary. You know, you had been raised this way, I suppose, to be to some degree. But the authenticity there and the and and the transparency of that, it's yeah. How do you get out of that? Like yeah. so like so many of us, you know, as a friend of mine who lives in Mississippi would say, the I am nots can be overwhelming. I'm not worthwhile. I'm not. Uh, beautiful. I'm not poetic. I'm not an artist. I'm not a painter. Blah, you know, add anything to that list, right? That and 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 I think you know the earlier comment about writing down a list of things you accomplished today. I mean, we we bend towards the negative, or at least I do. <laughs> you know. So anyway, I just wonder can can you talk a little bit about that? I know that's a really big question, but it seems appropriate. It is. It's a big question, but it's also a very very important question. And that weight of you know I weight of worthlessness and the not enoughness, you know, that comes not up. Not enoughness. Exactly. Right? This is th- th- this gig, this, this podcast, this book, this film, this whatever is not yep. enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it affects people on so many different levels. Um, you know, and I'm coming from this, from the fact that, you know, as an athlete and, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of strength and confidence. I felt very much, uh, and I still, to this day, I feel like I'm a strong, confident woman, right? But to think that that weight of not enoughness and worthlessness can affect the strongest people, um, sometimes it affects us the most because the world looks at us like, oh, you're strong, you're good, you're fine, you'll get right, through this. Right, right. And every time I heard that, you know, oh, Catherine, you're strong, I felt more alone. Like, no, I'm not. I'm a human being. I might be strong over here. Like, Fighting for women's rights, I'm really, I'm really freaking strong. That I don't mind that. That's great. But being um, a human being, being a woman, facing a lot of personal issues, I am just as strong and or weak as anybody else. You know, and that we we, we wear different hats in life. So sometimes we have to remember that it's okay to be strong over here, but that doesn't mean we're strong everywhere. And Let's identify that. And rather than trying to fix it, let's first just acknowledge it's okay to not be okay, right? It's okay to be a human being. It's okay to hurt um, when bad things happen. And that for me was, you know, obviously not, <laughs> I wish I had known that at the time of going mm, through this really yeah. tumultuous pain, but well, no, in, I'm some, in, <laughs> in some ways impossible to see. I, yeah. I interviewed, uh, by the way, a film that you're hopefully going to hear about, His Name is Ray was at the Toronto International Film Festival and I interviewed the director and a film uh, the producer yesterday and it's about a homeless guy uh, who lives in Toronto and a filmmaker drove by him every day and went okay I'm just going to stop and go and chat to the guy so he talked to him he's a heroin addict uh, was a sailor at a time in his life the whole film is one of the most personal I think and intimate portrayals I've certainly ever seen of this type of vulnerability but it's so human and desperate and tragic and and beautiful. And at one point in the film, he says about a friend of his that stole his coat, he said, oh, he's an addict. He should know better. Mm. What a great line coming from an addict himself. Like, how do you, so you're in this place of despair. Yeah. How do you, how do you see the light? You know, is, was it for you? Was it community? Was it was, it was, mean, little, was it was it cycling? Uh, you know, was it you know? It, it it's never one thing, right. but right. It, if anything, we have to be careful with sports because I know plenty of people who might be suffering with something mentally and emotionally, and they'll turn to their sport and they'll just do that, thinking like, "Oh, I just I have to ride and it'll go away." It'll, <laughs> right, sport. right. You know, anybody who's in endurance sports knows that that's a real. A, possibility and a way to think about things. I'll just sure, I'll sure. Work hundreds of miles of bike rides and I'll be fine. I'm like, okay, <laughs> no, <laughs> like that's that it's the bike isn't going to fix this for you. It can mm. be a great outlet. And of course sure, it was, sure. you know, for me it was in many ways, but it's not going to, um, it's not a person that you can talk to. Right. <laughs> so I knew when I finally reached out, it was my dad that I actually used the phrase, like, I think I need help, you know, mm. and something about, 
um, just letting another person in and letting them know that I'm not okay. That's, that's how it needs to start, you know, and if, if you can find a trusted friend or um, a family member, if you're lucky to have a close family member, that's great. Right. And also, you know, know that that person might not have the response on hand that you need to hear, mm, you know, because mm. that, that, that person might be like, oh, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I say? But that's not what this is about. If you have the ability and the strength to say out loud to somebody that you love and trust, I think I need help. Like that's the win right there. Uh, sure. No matter what they say in response, you have articulated your need. And that's the first step, right? So where I went from there and my, my dad was like, you know, okay, okay, honey, like what, what can I do? Right. Right. And at right. that point, honestly, it wasn't up to him to do anything. It was up for me to take the next sure. step. And, um, in my twenties, I had seen a therapist for, um, an eating disorder I dealt with in my youth. Um, so I knew immediately like, oh, I have to see a therapist to get through this. Um, Luckily, what we have at our disposal these days, you know, the the internet uh, is mm-hmm. can be a great accompaniment here, you know, to help you through change. Um, I used a site called Psychology Today. It's a popular magazine in the U.S. And um, Psychology Today, you can actually go in and enter your zip code and look up therapists who are near you. Also, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, it's and you can enter Makes in. Sense. A, Here's the insurance that I do have or don't have. Um, what will they take? What won't they take? Um, and then also you find the therapist based on what their strengths are. Almost sure. imagine like like internet dating, <laughs> but you're looking for a therapist that oh, way. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, I think there's a huge amount of wisdom there. You can't expect that the first person you choose necessarily or even go to see a few times is going to be the therapist that might make the difference for you, right? I'm so glad you bring that up. Absolutely. Because it, uh, I want everybody to know that um, the right therapist is out there for you. But if it's mm, not the first good. person, it's okay. Like, don't give yeah, up on this. Exactly. Symptom. And and I experienced that in my earlier years. Um, I tried talking to one woman and I just didn't connect with her. It wasn't like she was a bad person or a terrible therapist, but we just didn't right. have language learning together. And... Um, yeah. So same thing. So I did find an amazing therapist who got me through that really, really dark stretch of, of years and helped me turn the corner. Um, and again, yeah, you know, knowing that those tools are out there, the other thing you can do, you know, and they say that like when you're in a, a deep depression, um, you know what you should do, but it doesn't mean that you do it. It's like, you know, you can look for sure. the magic wand right next to you that says, okay, you know, just pick me up. I can help you. But it's still up to us to reach for that wand, so to speak. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's never easy. And I think I love that you talked about admitting that you have that issue and so on. I think perhaps maybe the real lesson or real takeaway here is for those of us who aren't in an extreme vulnerable place to maybe step back and just listen, to be, to be a friend to embrace when it's needed, uh, to, to, to try to, I don't know, create some kind of community around folks without being overbearing, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's not always easy either. Cause you know, you want your friend, you want to help, you want to step in, how, what can I do? And right. It's, it's so difficult, but uh, I love, I love that you, I love that you said there's a therapist out there for you. There's Mm -hmm. someone out there for you, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I can, can I, can we shift gears here a little bit? I want to ask you about, about, I mean, again, back to Robin Williams quote about words and ideas and so on, but Gabby Giffords here, page Mm -hmm. 42, Gabby Giffords amazingly survived being shot in the head, and now she is thriving and leading our nation as the imminent lobbyist for gun control. Christina Taylor's untimely death may be aware of her existence, but it was her life that opened a door for so many women. I might not even ever have known about her had we not experienced January 8th, nor had the courage to write about what happened that day, close quote. I mean, there's obviously way more, and we're only, what, 42 pages into the in, into the book. What struck me about that was the hyper-connectedness of it. Does that make sense? So again, mm-hmm. incremental change. Um, what what propels you to be an activist? What 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 is the catalyst for you to say, no, I'm putting on the fighting gloves. I'm gonna, you know, and and so this significant, horrific change in her life leads her to become this incredible lobbyist. Oh, can, can 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 you talk a little bit about this and and the impact that's had on your own life? 
Sure. Yeah. And for those who are are new to Gabby Giffords, she was our congresswoman in Arizona, um, and she was shot in a mass shooting in uh, January of 2011. And for us in Tucson, Tucson is a small, big city. You know, it's a real sense of community here, (laughs) which is why I've stayed. I love it. I love it here. And um, when that rocked our nation and we lost we lost so many in that shooting and Gabby survived, you know, being shot in the head. And like you mentioned in the quote, you know, she now is a huge advocate for, for gun control. Um, watching that example of somebody not just surviving, which would have been plenty, that would have been enough of an accomplishment. Of course, that would have been enough. Yeah. Right. And instead the ripple effect that she's created for all of us who are like, Oh my God, when the very worst happens, not only can we keep going, but we can step into the field of leadership. You know, you know what? I don't think anyone expected her to roll up her sleeves. And no. Yet, right? No, and not, you know, I, I don't know if you know this now, but her husband, Mark Kelly, is now senator of Arizona. And so she that. completely, you know, inspired him to to run and run for change. And Arizona has always been a quote unquote red state. And this year we flipped to blue. And Mark Kelly is now, you know, a very powerful senator, influential. And all of this really, truly stemmed from Gabby's influence. Um, so you can imagine it, you know, and it, it definitely left a big marker on me for, for being like, okay, what can I do? And where's my, where's my ability to create change? So she's a hero. And she is so kind, too, to present or to offer a blurb of support for this book. Yeah, so yeah. Really, really yeah, that's really so amazing. Oh, I'm I- <laughs> <laughs> for 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 me, it's just it, it and it's this is a constant reminder for me as well. You know, this isn't a, a, a prescriptive statement. It really is all connected. It is, and sometimes it takes a life lived to look back and say, "Wow, look at how those you know that hyperconnectivity was there." Right, and I don't know. It it just is is that helpful <laughs> for us. For, for us folks who, who are trying to change, who are trying to push back against the status quo in a particular way. And I think of all the movements right now, you know, the gender disparity around the world, the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and just, it's just, this, yeah, there's, everywhere you look, there's something to, to be active about. There is, there is. It's so important that we peel back the layers and we kind of look under yeah. the box, you know, and I, I think it's really quite astounding how when we think that something might be equal, that we've always assumed is equal, if we peel back the layers a little bit, there are so many things that are not what they seem, you know? And so yeah. it really, it was never about bikes. It was never about the Tour de France. It was about the fact that women weren't allowed somewhere. And that's not cool. That's not okay. So, you know, I always hope that that ripple effect what we were able to achieve at the Tour de France will resonate with people so that they can find their proverbial Tour de France and and follow our, our movement. Like, okay, what did they do? Okay. Then, then I'm going to try to do the same thing, which is why we put the uh, appendix in the back of, of the book, which I thought would make more sense to put it in the back rather than like sprinkle it in the middle or try to, right. You know, books with bullet points, they don't do it for me. I'm like, let me just tell my story. And then this stuff in the back will make a lot more sense. (laughs) Yeah. It's almost like the, it's almost like the curriculum guide in a way, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Uh, a nice segue. Sadly, we're going to, we're, we're going to need to wrap up here in a, in a minute or two. I know. Isn't that crazy talk? How fast that went? It's crazy. That is ridiculous. (laughs) So everything happens, period, deal with it, period. (laughs) is one of the, I don't know, I didn't actually count them. I don't think you number them either, but what are there, 20, 20 different sort of? I, it's 22 or 24. Something is it? Like okay. Yeah. 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 22. What, what would you call them? Sort of uh, laws? Uh, would you call them <laughs> Catherine's principles? Like what would you? <laughs> How about guiding points? <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yes. I think that you should have had a drawing of a lighthouse there. I think that would have been. Oh, I love that. that. I love that. <laughs> At first, I thought it would be top 10, but then it just kind of kept right. going, and I'm it never on our list. So I'm like, well, we'll just end it where it ends, and it happened to be 22. So there it is. Yeah. No, it's great. And what I love, and I'm just going to come back to the words again and to the quote and to the diary and the post-it notes, I bet you some of those weren't like bolded for you until you started to put pen to paper 
and you started to sort of unpack some of this stuff. And I think that's a really wonderful thing about the whole creative kind of process as well. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but that that's, I, does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. And I agree with you. I think it's important to note that this book took me three years to write mm. and for two different reasons. One was that I needed to start it at a time where I felt confident and comfortable because I knew there was going to be a lot of vulnerability and authenticity doing its thing, <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, I really did not start this book until, gosh, was it 20, 2018? That was a good four, leaning on five years past uh, when I went through my hardest stretch right. of life. Right. Right. So if I had tried to write this book in 2014 or 15, it would have been just a jumbled mess and probably a lot of lies. Mm. Like, oh, I'm okay. I'm fine. I wasn't right. Fine. right. Right. So timing was one element. The other big element of why it took me three years to write was because unlike my previous books, I was not given a book advance. So I had to work other jobs and then write stand kind of around that time. Right. Schedule. Right. And I love telling people this part is that um, despite having three previous books, the publishers kept turning down the book proposal for Stand, citing, whoa, a book about women who stand up and fight for change? Oh, that's not going to sell. <laughs> that was there. That was, and I was wow. like, at first, wow. my agent and I were like, okay, maybe that's just one publisher. Yeah, no, yeah of course. Like yeah. 20 plus publishers who also. Wow, is yeah. that right? That's crazy and, talk. That's and, bonkers. It's bonkers. It's bonkers, especially in this modern day and age, <laughs> and yeah. especially in like that 2018 time frame when we were shopping. Sure. The proposal. We, it was bonkers that they would think that because society was truly saying like, no, people who stand up and fight um, are in demand. That's what we want to see. <laughs> so Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I, I had two choices. One was write this on my own and put it out into the world on my own terms or don't write it at all and just go away. And that was just not an option that last one. <laughs> no, it's, it's so good. I have to ask you this last, there's always more, more to ask. Uh, I find mm -hmm. most interviews, and I think this is a good thing, feel like they shouldn't end. They just, and I don't, and I actually don't think a great conversation really ever ends because there are, you know, uh, points and questions and all kinds of things. You talk about, uh, I think throughout the book, frankly, you talk about sort of the what if questions kind of what if the world could be a better place? I don't know that you asked that question, but what if this sport could actually be equal? I believe you actually, you do ask that question. Yeah. So imagine the world to be a better place and then do what you can to get there. <laughs> Is that exactly. kind of the, the big takeaway from stand, would you say? I w yes. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is, you know, just keep asking what if, you know, yeah. What if it were like this or what if it weren't like this? Either way is a great pathway to lead to those questions of um, what's next, right? What if, and then, you know, one of my favorite questions is just, and, and what can I do? And what can we do to get it to that place? So what if an and are, are really powerful tools. We just have to be brave enough to use those tools. So great. Love that the blurb on the back says that, uh, and I love that it's so specific, but in 2009, you turn wonder into action. That's just awesome to me. Uh, where can people get, can, can get this book? Stand, and do you have it? Right, you should yeah. be, that, that strikes me like it should be a t-shirt as well. Have Thank you considered you. Yeah. <laughs> Where can we get the book? Um, Stand is available where books are sold. Um, and during these pandemic times, even if the book isn't in the actual store, your local bookstore can order it for you. Nice. And also it's, it's available on Amazon on all, in, in every country. So .ca, .com, .uk, whatever it is, it's out there. And it's also available through Barnes & Noble. So Fantastic. Um, three sites and it's paperback, digital, hardcover, whatever your reading preference is. I have not yet gotten to an Audible version because... That's a lot of time. I will get there eventually, but the uh, imprint form is out there. And is the, is the filmmaker in you thinking about optioning it at some point, hopefully? Oh my gosh, David, I'm so glad you asked. I would love nothing more than to have Stand optioned. And maybe you and I can connect on the next steps there, as you seem to know quite a few people who might be up for that. <laughs> I, well, I've been interviewing a lot of filmmakers yes, for the last five or exactly. six years. It's quite, And it's really quite remarkable how 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 connected it all all is and and everyone's looking for a good story and the right story thank you, know? you. i so, appreciate that and yeah, I, I do think yeah. we have something here and i don't mean to suggest like oh my story is so important it's worth a movie but i do yeah. think what is worth a movie 
is somebody who is not famous, not wealthy, not an Olympic gold medalist. If I was able to create change, yeah, it's proof that yeah. we all can. So I want yeah, that it's story good. told. And that story, we, we need to continue to hear that narrative yes. over and over and over because yeah. I don't know what it is. We're, we're pre-genetically determined, it seems to me, and I don't believe in determinism, to, to not think that. Totally. That we can't make a difference, you know. It's it, but we so can, and I, I love your story, and I love uh, uh, how you really have stood up and and uh, said this is bonkers. There's the T-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's this great. is bonkers on the back. This it. is bonkers on the back. This yeah. is bonkers. Inequality <laughs> is bonkers. <laughs> All right, I'll get going on the T-shirts. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, website: CatherineBertine dot com. Yes, correct. And that's B E R T I N E. Yes, and this Catherine is K A T H R Y N. There are many versions there, out there. <laughs> there are many versions. We've been talking with Catherine Bertin today about her new book Stand and about a whole uh, a lot of other things. Thanks so much for your time today. I re- really, it was great having you on the show. Thank you so much, David. It was so great to be here talking with you. So there you have it. My interview with Catherine Bertin. We had a great time. I hope you could tell talking about her new book. You can get it wherever uh, good books are sold. Stand, a memoir on activism a manual for progress Uh, you can also uh, follow Catherine on social media as well and I hope you choose to do that don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and speaking please sign up for our newsletter there Uh, you can do that uh, face to face we only send a couple out a year we really won't bother you but it is a good way to keep people posted more importantly love for you to sign up for our YouTube channel subscribe there give us a like but really if, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to write a review for us on iTunes or Spotify. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen uh, to podcasts at. And we would so appreciate that. Socially mediate the heck out of us if you can. Share us on social. Send it to family and friends. And we're looking forward to... uh, I wish I could say seeing you next time. But uh, we will uh, see you metaphorically very soon. And thanks again for listening to Face to Face.